I will immediately hand over to Dino. Uh, he is the CEO and founder of Telspace Systems, which is a South African um, IT security company, which was founded in 2002. Um, and on that note, I will hand over. Now we've got tech. <laughs> cool. Thanks for the patience, everybody. So I uh, kind of feel felt a little bit helpless there, but we're on track. Thanks, guys. So I'm um, going to get straight into it. Um, it was supposed to be a 50-minute talk, so we're going to push it into a 30-minute talk. I'm going to speak pretty fast, so sorry about that. But uh, thanks for sticking it through. Thanks for um, coming to the talk. Thanks to the organizers. Appreciate everything. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, so basically, I work in a penetration testing space. I've been working in this uh, penetration testing space for about 20 years. And um, I'm pretty much trying to keep a work-life balance, not really working properly. And um, basically, I'm about 4,000, 5,000 RFQs in, in, in my career. So I thought, let's make, a, let's make a talk about some interesting points that I've seen. So what exactly is this talk about? So basically, it's about um, essentially killing the buzzwords. It really irritates us. Because what we're seeing at the moment is app, cyber, kill chain, next gen, all that kind of stuff that uh, people are basically buying into. And when I say people, it's corporates. They're buying into that kind of marketing. Um, so essentially, you know, how easy would it be to basically make a company, um, you know, put a website up on the internet, and basically that company could be fake, apply for RFQs, RFPs, and basically um, take advantage of those processes, and a lot more in line with that. But essentially, um, for me, there's a lot that's kind of incorrect with the RFQ process. There's a lot of problems with the RFQ process, and um, what I really want to kind of stress here is that, um, you know, companies are getting broken into now basically from password compliance, from like patch management, misconfigurations, phishing. It's not really like this insane zero day stall, um, or yet, sorry. And uh, basically like, you know, don't buy into the hype. That's, that's the problem that we're having. So um, what, are we, what are we doing wrong? Like what's, what's wrong with the RFQ process? Essentially it's, it's basically the procurement process and whether you're in blue teaming or red teaming doesn't really make a difference. Uh, this talk's going to be quite interesting for you. It's also not just specifically in my country. I'm from South Africa. It's, it's a worldwide issue. Uh, I'm going to be showing you like real life scenarios, real life networks that basically I've seen that are publicly available for you guys to actually go and see. And the kind of information that's going to help you during the enumeration phase. Um, essentially companies basically when they want big sets of work they go out on the RFQ, RFP process. So in other words like let's say there's a big pen testing uh, job that needs to be done over a year period or let's say that there's endpoint protection that needs to be implemented. They go out on RFP and they say hey you know we're looking for suppliers that can basically help us with this specific need. So on my side it's basically quite cool because you can get a lot of information from that as a potential pen tester or an attacker. And um, there's a lot of complications with that. So essentially what, you, what you're doing is inviting the criminals in, inviting the hackers in um, to come and learn more about your inner workings of your company and can kind of be likened to the inside the threat. Case in point, um, essentially like last month we attended a, attend a briefing or RFQ briefing and basically there were 40 companies there. Uh, in my country we don't even have 40 pen testing firms. We basically have three or four. So there's just basically a whole bunch of random people that were there learning about some really hectic stuff uh, about networks. Essentially that list when people come isn't actually really even vetted. So it's a big problem. And we're basically inviting the hackers. We're, we're inviting guys. We're saying hey guys like this is our entire list of IP addresses. This is what our internal network looks like. This is what our diagrams look like. Please give me a quote. That's amazing. So we could essentially be you know sharing this really confidential information with people that we don't know. That's what we're doing. And when you're actually doing a pen test or if you're on the blue team or red team, basically that information is generally available on the internet. Sometimes it's actually in uh, adverts on, in newspapers still because uh, especially for government you have to actually advertise these things so that it's a fair process. Um, and I'll get into, uh, get into a little bit more. Case in, case in point here is that basically if we tender for a set of work and we go in and we say, all right, well we're going to go in super cheap so that we specifically win this work because obviously price normally wins and we're a really bad company and we're basically a malicious attacker, we know we're going to win that work. So we gain access to the whole network without really doing too much. We're not really a legitimate pen, pen testing firm. We're basically the bad guys. Better yet, what we can really do is basically find out all this information about the actual penetration test and about the actual company and then uh, when you know the whole RFQ process actually ends we can drop out of it 
And then we know as an example like let's say a penetration testing firm is basically going to be doing testing during a certain period. We know this is happening. So during that period of testing we can actually legitimately penetrate their network as bad guys. So they get blamed for what we're doing. That's going to happen. So if you know you're getting a penetration test and we take down some servers or whatever the story is, that real vendor is probably going to get blamed for what we did. All right, so what about resellers? Now the massive problem worldwide is that there's a skill shortage. Everybody knows that. So a lot of people are basically reselling services as well and we often find out about like the reselling uh, you know actual tenders through random resellers that basically want to make money off certain you know types of jobs like antivirus or endpoint security or whatever it may be. Um, and really essentially it goes back to what I said. It's because cyber, cyber is hot now. It's like a cyber thing. So everybody is trying to make money off that and I hate that word. Um, and actually just in line with that we've got badges that basically says forget the buzzwords so anybody wants a badge after the talk please let me know. Uh, because we really feel like that uh, people we, we've got to stop talking about the cyber stuff now. But um, essentially what resellers do is they basically put a markup on a markup and a markup and a markup and your price is like you know 10% at the end of the day in comparison to what they're actually charging the end customer. So um, what I'm basically saying in terms of resellers and everything else is that you need to test the procurement process as well in your organization and when you're doing penetration tests that's a huge portion of it. So if you're doing like a red teaming assessment over a period of let's say six months or whatever it may be, test the procurement process. You know basically try and sell something to the company. Get on the, get on the books, get into the company that way. So you could become like a contractor for something completely random but you're inside the business through the procurement process. I mean you could sell toilet paper, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. So attack the procurement process is exactly what I'm saying and if you're on the blue team like you know take a look at those procedures. Proof of concepts, this is amazing. Anybody ever asked for a, a, a set of work first to test you out and then if that works good they'll give you the contract? Don't do it ever because basically it happens a lot and it's also again incorrect procedures. It shouldn't be an RFQ process. Basically what you're doing is you're giving a bunch of random people access to your network if it's in uh, production to test. So a case study again, it's an international bank, it was massive. We got asked uh, to give them a, like as, as an example a quote for some pen testing work. We gave them a quote for pen testing work. Um, they came back to us and they said oh cool we want to go, we want to go and do this stuff. Um, anyway they asked us for uh, a free test, we said no and then they said okay cool we'll find another way to do it. What did they do? They came out with the RFQ and they included the proof of concept as part of the terms of the RFQ but on a non-production server. So we said cool like you know we have to do it, everybody else is doing it. Anyway they came back to us and they were like oh you guys have made the finals now, it's only between you and somebody else. Uh, you have to do the proof of concept. We said alright give us a non-production server. I don't think any of you will guess that they gave us a production internet banking application to test and then they WhatsApped us credentials, two sets of credentials. <laughs> I mean uh, as a, I don't even really know what to say about that but that is a legitimate case. It actually happened last month. So proof of concepts are really bad. Don't do them. It's, there's a lot of other reasons behind it but uh, legitimately it's, it's really bad for business and for procurement and for security. Okay so how do we exploit this process? So like this is a really complex diagram and you can see that uh, you know from this we basically had a, we created a 160,000 line um, piece of software that enabled us to exploit the whole process. So we can get all this uh, information, correlate events across different media that basically enabled us to gather advanced information, right? Um, I'm, I'm actually completely joking. That's a search engine optimization uh, diagram, and uh, we don't need to code anything. We basically, just go to Google and search for RFQ and then the company name. So uh, there's nothing complex about it at all. What I'm going to do, basically, for you guys, is I'm going to put URLs at the top of everything that I show you, so you can see that it's not something that's made up. You guys can literally go there. Um, and sorry I'm speaking fast but I've got to get through this uh, prez within a certain amount of time. All right, let's give you some personal examples before we actually go into the, the ones that are available on the internet. So uh, we had a, a company that issued us with a $2 million purchase order for a set of work that wasn't actually supposed to be given to us. It was supposed to be given to another pen testing firm. Um, don't even really know how that happens but again procurement issue. Um, we had a government department which, is, which was a financial intelligence center issuing us with an award letter with our competitors, a major competitor's name on it, with their pricing on it and basically said like, you know, dear Dino, congratulations for winning this work. That, this, that was basically um, a, a cheapest tender wins. We knew that obviously that's not the case because we, we had this letter. 
we have a uh, major telco, worldwide telco. Um, very hard to get on these lists. Very hard to get on the lists. And they sent us the entire Excel sheet with every single vendor's pricing, with every single role that they have. It's just crazy. I mean, like this kind of information is being leaked. That's it's really confidential information. This is stuff that we know that's being tested by certain companies. We know how much they're charging. We could just basically phone up and say, "Hey, we're phoning from X Y Z as part of this pen test," and then you know do certain things. And then even worse, like we had a massive uh, revenue operator, like internal revenue service, kind of a similar thing. Um, we're basically catered for a specific vendor. That's very very common as well. And basically what happened here is that um, they told us we couldn't win the work because we didn't know an internal acronym for a specific system that we never dealt with before in our lives. So that also happens where basically like there's specific vendors that obviously you know are catered for in this kind of process. But that can also be exploited because if you know as an example who these uh, companies are using on a regular basis and you know that nobody else is doing the work, you can kind of call on behalf of them again um, or do something malicious. So what can we get uh, from this whole process? I listed a whole bunch of stuff here. There's a lot more network diagrams uh, of very, very confidential stuff. Uh, internal incident response procedures, internal external IPs, hosts, websites, application, firewall types, firewall rules, questions and answer sessions, um, patch levels, operating systems. I mean like the list basically goes on. Um, and the more that you search and the more you get into it, it's kind of like this really deep rabbit hole and you kind of get involved in it. And I think for this specific talk I went to over 350 RFQs um, and basically I just couldn't put them all in here. It's just that simple. So let's uh, get into the meat. So these are real examples. You probably can't see at the back there. If you can, you've got amazing sets of eyes. But um, basically these are international companies. I'm going to give you examples from all over the world. This particular example is from the UK. And uh, this basically is a typical RFQ document. It's basically um, a nice breakdown over here of what these guys are running. So if you look over here, it's basically telling you they're running a Rome SSL VPN, uh, VPN, and basically BlackBerry Enterprise Server. I don't really know who runs BlackBerry Silver anyway. Uh, Microsoft Exchange and Outlook. What kind of antivirus they're running? Uh, general Purpose File Service in SAN. Um, it, it basically carries on, um, on and on and on. It's a very big tender document, so I'm just going to kind of fly through this. But um, this carries on in terms of the BlackBerry Enterprise Server Exchange Outlook and how they actually handle the data, what's in scope, what's out of scope. But we can basically see that they run super outdated versions of Outlook here, and there's really no support for patching those either. So right at the bottom, you'll see that the laptops run Outlook 2003 and then the thin desktops Outlook 2010. So we know that there's no patching on those. We kind of know, you can see where I'm going with this basically for your internal recon. And uh, you can actually see that there's two MS Exchange servers that are subject to specific health checks that need to be done. But basically this carries on uh, in this document. This is the best for me. It's basically Windows 2008 domain controllers. They actually even tell you where, which offices they're actually at, like physically located. So you can actually see there's like one at Sheffield. Um, for example, there's antivirus deployment servers there. They're running uh, Windows 2003 DHCP servers. Um, and this is actually an international very, very hint big international bank um, that's basically running with us. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're an attacker, you know that you're going to go for the 2003 servers or 2008 servers, it just really depends. And a lot of them just can't get patched. Right, the nice part about this is they tell you what's out of scope as well. So they don't just include what's in scope, it's also like out of scope. Um, but it's amazing because they tell you that there's 16 firewalls. So you get 16 firewalls, where the extra net is. Um, and they're basically going to saying like they've had nine picks. And, and specific ASA firewalls with 18 Nokia, which is also something that I don't really see very often. But basically, it's at the bottom here, and it tells you that basically there's seven firewalls in Sheffield and the amazing 17 in London. So this, it basically gives you a really good idea of where things are physically located, not just for like internal pen testing, external pen testing, but social engineering as well. Right. Uh, this is awesome because basically, if I'm an attacker, I'm, I'm looking for some kind of web application. Um, Typically, that's going to give me easy access. And this one goes into detail about how things are actually uploaded through EduServe, which is like an educational platform. And uh, they have upload and download facilities here. And if you're into application assessments or web, web penetration testing, you pretty much know what you have to go for there. You know, upload a shell, and there you go. All right, so I kind of catered a little bit more to the US as well for this. So you and obviously governments. So like this is. Um, uh, at the top you'll see like .gov and what I've done is basically put the whole URL there so you can go there now if you like and check it out. But basically like it's, it's across the board. So it's, it's anything from telcos, banks, gov, carries on. 
this is a little bit blurry I think for you guys at the back so I'm just going to kind of go into it a little bit. But um, on this side you can basically see, it's, it's over here, you know, two domain controllers, what versions they're running again, how many IP addresses are internal and external. So basically we know how, you know, it's probably one flat no segregation on the network and um, you know, what kind of exchange servers they're running once again. Um, at the bottom what kind of firewalls they're running and basically like it's given us a really good idea of um, how Oaklawn government works. So in terms of enumeration, like we don't really have to do too much from our side. Sometimes it actually goes into like their password compliance policies even. Um, but they're giving you everything on pretty much a silver platter. Here's another one. This is from Kirkland, also a government uh, website. It's quite cool because if actually this is something separate to what this talks about. But basically at the top you can see assets, finance and admin, finance admin, PDFs, purchasing, carries on. But um, this is what we call the QA document. So earlier in the presentation I told you about questions and answers, right? So what basically happens is when you, when you basically pitch for the work, you can ask questions and it's up to kind of the customer if they're going to tell you, you know, the answers to the questions. This is awesome. This is amazing. Because basically it even tells you they're running like some form of uh, SCADA network. So you can see on the, in this, that electric water and sewerage is actually in scope for penetration testing. Even, even more mind blowing is they told you when the last penetration test was done, this was 2011. This is like probably going to find quite a lot of stuff. Um, and I mean, it, you know, it carries on again. What kind of devices are running? Running Cisco devices. All of our servers are running Windows, um, and we standardize the operating systems to Windows 7 and Windows 10. So basically, from the outset, you know, kind of which exploits you're going to need. You know, what you're looking for. Um, I mean, this is actually really funny because one of the vendors actually asked at the bottom, and I don't know if you can read at the back again, is that um, are there guard dogs and CCTV and fire extinguishers? <laughs> And you know what they said? No, we don't have guards or cameras or dogs. So pretty much for social engineering, you're cool, you're good to go. Um, more worldwide ones. So this is, a, this is quite serious because it's actually a questions and answers document to this as well. But I want to give you different kind of examples. And this one is actually a network topology. I know it says a proposed network diagram that's actually underneath this specific um, screenshot. But um, yeah, you can see the IT network diagram high level is covered under the audit. Um, which is provided below and this basically gives you everything. How the internal network is actually structured, external network is actually structured, where the firewalls are and in the bottom right is basically all the endpoints. So you kind of know where you've got to go in terms of your actual, you know, attacks which is quite cool for us, not for them. This is amazing. This is a, a internet banking platform um, and basically they let us know what kind of platforms they're actually running off um, and how many external IPs they have related to that, what kind of product it is. Uh, they're running Oracle 11G, only one server, you know. Um, so basically like what we're finding here is that the banks aren't shy with giving us information as well um, and I'll get into a little bit more about Swift a little bit later but this carries on. I mean it literally is like an endless, endless thing. Um, these are also possibly one of my favorites between this and another one. These are web applications, right? And um, web applications are quite cool because when they go through scoping documents um, and they're sometimes very sensitive like these ones, this is a CCC, CCC payment portal, they give you like a URL, temporary URL, just temp in brackets, so temporary. But basically it goes down to like what versions are running in terms of MySQL, PHP, if there's multiple roles in the application, like five different roles in this case. Um, are we going to be testing in production or staging? This one says staging. But I mean, you know, we kind of already know what it's going to be like because we can, if we were an attacker, we can basically just start attacking that now already. Um, on the other side, it's quite funny because this is for IT security professionals. So in the top right you'll see that this is primarily used for facilitating e-learning. Um, and again, kind of goes through the same questions. We've got everything. Right. We know that it's running this specific version of Moodle. I don't know if anybody's ever worked with that before, but you know that there's a lot of vulnerabilities. So basically, we know what to attack before we've even done anything kind of invasive. Um, again, as part of the same tender, um, project name, this is a big blue button web portal. We get another URL that we can test. And again, uh, we know this is JSP, staging environment, the same kind of information. Not going to go through it uh, line by line. In line with this, there's more problems with the RFQ process. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have actually dealt with it, but again, for your penetration testing and social engineering, it's quite cool because, and on blue teaming, it's good for you guys to know. Um, because basically, there's a lot of platforms that let you know when a tender has actually been awarded, right? So, in other words, like let's say that there's a whole bunch of guys that went, went out for work and, uh, you know, we won the work, whatever the story is. 
This is a platform in, in my specific country but we have one, we have a lot here in the USA as well. Um, so if you have like government spending you usually know, you know who actually won that specific contract. But um, I want to basically go through this in a little bit of detail because this is a massive issue. We know who are, who's actually winning tenders. This is a problem. So uh, this was actually for financial services board and this is public information, the URLs at the top of this. It's not like we did anything dodgy. Um, and we can see that Deloitte actually won this set of penetration testing work, right? Um, and we can actually see at the bottom that there's a whole bunch of other vendors who are not successful but also the director's names. So there's one or two vendors that you'll, you'll basically know um, that are actually really good vendors. And then you'll have a lot of other vendors that you've never heard of and that goes in line with what I said earlier about these like dodgy resellers putting markups and markups and markups and you don't really know who's actually testing your network. But another problem with this is that you can phone in this case from Deloitte and you can start the pen testing, you know, or ask questions about their network because they know that they've awarded the pen testing and Deloitte as an example is a very big company. So, you know, I'm phoning from them and I'm asking for information and when can we start? When's the pen testing on? I mean, it's kind of endless because um, if you know when the pen testing is happening, like I said earlier, and you're a bad guy, you can exploit that process. But um, essentially, what I was telling you about um, price discrepancies and stuff, I just want to highlight something. So if I go back to the screenshot, you'll basically see uh, there's some really good vendors here and the average median price is about uh, two or three hundred thousand dollars, right? And if you go into this screenshot, uh, right at the bottom, that's about two and a half million dollars. So there's a little bit of a difference there between <laughs> what we're talking about in terms of resellers and the real guys that are doing the work. Right. So this is another one. Uh, URL at the top. This is actually back in my country in South Africa. Um, also uh, another QA document but this is, this is awesome again and this is not specifically again for my country but we find this in a lot of documents. In this instance we can basically see again operating systems they're running but we can see they're running Splunk as well and we can see that um, at the top it says like you know do we need to give a high level network architecture diagram? It's not really required because everything's from a centralized location so probably again you know flat network. Um, the, the nice thing about this is they break up the endpoints for us as well. So about 300 servers, 700 endpoints, so many uh, thin clients and there's quite a few um, remaining IPs after that. But they even go to, to a level where they basically say they only have about 10 file changes a month. So that's awesome. Right, this carries on. What specific model of Cisco ASA are you using? Well, they tell us. There's only two of these firewalls are in high avail availability setup. Um, are you using integrated IPS in a firewall device? Yes, we are, which is licensed. Thank goodness it's licensed. And uh, the best part, which I actually just left out of this uh, actual screenshot, is the bottom. It says, like, what is the expected SLA response for intrusion detection? <laughs> so we basically know how long, you know, they're going to take to react to us if they actually catch us. Right, this is my favorite one of the prayers. Uh, this is our reserve bank. Pretty serious. Um, and uh, they're going to detail about Samex Web and into Swift and Samos. It's quite serious. Um, again, this is publicly available, not doing anything wrong. It's up here. But um, basically, it's business systems and technology. And this is really bad. Um, this shouldn't be online, to be very honest. But it, go it gets much worse, unfortunately, because they come back and tell us exactly how things work on Swift Alliance and uh, how it works through VPN and the actual client browser. And uh, th this is the logical view, apparently. So um, anyway, as an attacker, thanks very much. I really wanted to know how things work. Um, and actually it gets worse, which is crazy. Um, they tell us exactly how things actually work in terms of sand storage um, that runs DB2 DBMS. And basically there's a web application that we can basically utilize. Um, and transactional messages are sent and received via the Samos application that I spoke about. So transactional messages are what we're kind of looking for to steal the money. Um, and obviously via MQ and Swift Alliance access. But um, you know, it carries on going into SwiftNet and it tells us how we can actually send and receive Swift messages. And to be honest, when you're doing a red team, you've never dealt with Swift before, it, it's quite technical. So it's quite nice that they break it down here for us, um, to be honest. And obviously the SwiftNet secure IP network. But this basically carries on and you can look through this in more detail um, when we release the slides because I don't want to go through this line by line. But basically it, it provides everything from user authentication and authorization through to how things work in very, very big detail. Um, the nice thing is it actually tells us that um, HTTP connectivity works just fine. It's good that they're using HTTPS. But um, it's really pretty much easy money from here if we w were to attack this network. Uh, the nice thing here is that they actually tell us about two factor authentication as well. So we know they're running two factor USB tokens. It's at the top here with PKI certificate combinations provided by S Swift. But the worst part of everything for me personally 
besides the fact that they've given us all this, is that at the bottom it says a successful vendor will be provided with additional details. We don't, don't know how much more we basically need. We kind of have everything here, but it says, bef you know, once we've actually put an NDA in place. So, okay. So, um, I just wanted to highlight here basically that, um, again, this is not just for penetration testing. This is across the board. So, whatever you deal with, if it's like AV as an example, if it's EDR, if it's anything in cyber, like I was talking about earlier, all those hot kind of words that are the buzzwords at the moment, um, you know, it's everything across the board. So, just to iterate that towards the end of my presentation is that this is obviously very big um, municipal government website and it's in Canada. Yeah, this provides a lot of different stuff. And uh, these guys went out uh, specifically for endpoint protection. And we know they're running Synaptic endpoint protection. We know which licenses they're running. We know how many units they need. Uh, and basically, it carries on. Literally, like, uh, you know, I can, you can basically get really sucked into this in long term because there's so much information that's out there. And it's, it's not just like random targets, it's very specific targets that are looked for in different, for example, um, uh, sectors. So, you know, this one, for example, is municipal government. Previous ones are telcos. Um, the one I'm going to go go into next is actually a gas company. So uh, this is Oman Gas, um, and this is it's a huge multi-billion-dollar company. And again, we're looking at endpoint protection for these guys, uh, and we know that they're running McAfee uh, plus endpoint protection. They want, they're looking to upgrade to um, CTP or uh, CTP, which complete endpoint threat protection. All these buzzy words again. Um, and we know how again how many kind of endpoints they have and so forth. So what I'm basically saying um, is that the information that you're putting out there, this is, this is crazy because we could get a, as an example, a McAfee license and play with it before we actually do our red teaming or if you're a legitimate attacker, you know, you're going to have those. Um, but basically what I'm saying is the information that you're putting out there, you've got to be really careful with and I know that like all these processes are in, in place in corporates to stop forward and everything else and, but they're not really working in our industry and uh, it's actually adverse, it's actually working in the opposite direction because you know, when we, do, when we do kind of a red team or a pen test now, we look for whatever's out there before even doing scans and end maps and everything else. But on the other side of that, um, solving this issue is really hard. It's not something that's going to be solved overnight. And, um, you know, I can only give like my best advice based on what I've seen in the last 20 years. It's hard. It's really hard. But um, because you, your hands are basically tied if you're like a security professional, you have to go through the normal procurement process. Um, but closed tender process with trusted vendors is a must. So vet basically all the vendors that you use. They have to be properly vetted, like qualified. Um, you know, um, you can basically have contactable references with track records. They have to have a work history. They have to have staff credentials. Each staff member that works on your project should be subject to criminal and, and credit checking. Um, the whole company as a whole should be vetted. So it's not just like randomly putting it out there. Like don't advertise on like newspapers and, and like on in, on in newspapers and on the websites. I know it's tricky for procurement, but you have to. You can show them up presentation if you like. And basically, like for me, um, the bottom line is, you know, don't put information out there that you that you wouldn't be proud of. Um, basically, sharing, you know, with potential intruders because anybody can get this information. So. Um, Basically, remember this presentation next time you're doing a pen test or if you're on the blue team and you're going out for pen testing or EDR or whatever it may be. And um, that's basically it. I sped through it. I think I have two minutes left from what I can see. Um, but thanks very much, guys. Thanks for also waiting on the, you know, earlier with the AV issues. So.